Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless his holy, his wonderful name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, for his love will forever remain. Your creator is worthy of praise. You sustain all his poor, all his grace. He poured all his mercy on those who would fear. He poured all his love, his forgiveness of sin. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, bless his holy, his wonderful name. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to talk today about why it'd be a good idea to reject Islam and its teachings. And I do it in love. I'm not here to insult anybody, but just to bring the truth and to open up eyes. Um, just going to read 1 Corinthians 13 before I start. And this is what it says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love does not parade itself. It's not proud. It does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. It's not easy. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but then that which is perfect has come. Then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I fought as a child. 
But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as, as I also am known. And these three abide, faith, hope and love. But the, but the greatest of these is love. So I'm going to just speak in love today because the Bible says that God is love. And God's, it's not God's will that any should perish, that all should come to the knowledge of repentance and put their faith in Jesus Christ for eternity. So I just thank you, Father, today for this opportunity to present your truth and also to highlight the untruths, Lord. So I just thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father for your peace and your love and your joy and your patience lord i pray lord for your holy spirit to be present here today to work through me lord to speak the truth in love and to do it in a way that lifts people up and opens their eyes to you in jesus name i pray amen amen so the first thing that i'm going to talk about is I just want to, I'm going to talk about this book here and it's called Why I Forsook Islam and it's written by a guy called Ibn Said, ex-Iman and he gives some compelling reasons why he left Islam and I just want to share them today and if there's anyone watching this who's a Muslim or who's having doubts about the faith then I ask you with a, with a with a humble heart to just un, just to look at what this man has said and do some investigation yourself if you've got any doubts. So um, this guy started to do some research. He wanted to know about who God was. So he says here, I first of all I took the Holy Quran. Sawahali translation, translated by Sheikh Abdul Salah Al Fazi, and he is a former chief Qadi in Kenya. The first verse I started with was this, and it's called Quran Suratul An Biya 21 to 91, which says, "And remember her who guarded her chastity." We breathed into her of our spirit, and we made her and her son a sign for all peoples. And he says, after reading that verse, he started to analyse each phrase one by one. For that is the way forward to him who wants to know the truth. Now, the verse itself talks about Mary, the mother of Isa, which is Jesus. It says that Mary kept herself pure and after keeping herself pure, Allah said, and we breathed unto her our spirit. Here, without any doubt, the spirit is Jesus Christ. Now, the last phrase says that Mary and Jesus, her son, became a sign to all nations. And he says, I took the word spirit and he did a thorough study on it. Although here God has used the words our spirit, he meant his own spirit. So in order to support his claims, he said he took a book called Swahihul Bukhar. And it's often referred to by the Sunni Muslims. This book is very voluminous, means a lot of information in it, a lot of volumes. And most Muslims do not possess it except a few learned people. And it is second after the Quran and is closely followed by one called uh, Muslim. Then the rest, which I may mention as the Lord may guide me. And he says he took the book Bukhari and he read the part that says, and he said that is Jesus is the spirit of the almighty God. And that is how it is. He says the story is a bit long, but he was only interested in the portion where Muhammad spoke, saying that Isa is the spirit of the almighty God. 
up to that point, he told himself, Isa being the spirit of God is not a big deal to him. And he came across this statement in the book, book Bukhari. And this is what it says in Bukhari. I'll quote the reference so you can look it, look it, look it up yourself. And it's Sahih Bukhari 4, 506. And it says, when any human being is born, Satan pinches the body with his two fingers, except Isa, the son of Miriam, whom Satan tried to pinch but failed, for he touched the placenta instead. So remember, these are Muhammad's own words. And he said at this point, when he was reading this, he was getting, he, he got disturbed by it. And he said, are these not the same words I have been reading over and over before, which are now revealing to me much heavier new meanings? So the Quran says that Isa is the spirit of the almighty God. And Prophet Muhammad is here confirming the same thing. Muhammad again adds that Isa was never defiled by Satan. And he realised he was getting frustrated. So he decided to stop studying about Prophet Isa. He stayed for two days. And on the night of the 28th of December 2005, he says, the spirit of God spoke to him. He says, don't give up doing the research. So he took his books again and he sat down, legs folded, just as the Muslims normally do when they are seated. And he said to himself, the other day when I was doing this research, I found that Isa was never defiled by Satan, but all other human beings are. And he did a study about the death of Isa. So he opened up the chapter 21 of the Quran and he dwelt on verse 34, which says, we granted not to any man before the permanent life. If then thou shouldest die, would they live permanently? And he said, after reading this verse, several questions and then answers were lingering in his mind. And one of the questions that he asked himself was this. He said, we the Muslims believe without reasonable doubt that Isa, Jesus, is just an ordinary human being. But the Quran in chapter 4, verses 157 to 158, says that Isa, the son of Mary, is in heaven alive. And the Hadith also confirmed the same point, that Isa is alive and is in heaven. And the other troubling question was, it is said that he was just a mere human being who lived over 600 years before Muhammad. He wasn't contented with the Swahili translation. So he took a much bigger and superior translation that is purely Arabic. And it, it was called Ibn Kifir. So he could check how this verse is translated here. When he opened it, he said he got the biggest shock of his life to find that the translator did the most accurate translation than the Swahili one. He said the Lord clearly states that whether he was a prophet or an apostle or any other righteous man, he was a human being. Human being. He indeed died, he who lived before Muhammad. He said he was in great trouble and confusion, more so than before. So this issue that Isa was just an ordinary man disturbed him for nearly two months, from December 2005 to February 2006. And he said it took him two months because the astonishing kind of holiness the Prophet Isa is accorded in our very own Islamic books is unbelievable. He said he thought to himself, it seems we probably read and recite without paying keen attention to understanding the deeper meaning of what is written. It is a dangerous habit. He wasn't satisfied and he took the Quran and he opened Surah Maryam, which is verse 1919, 19, which says, Nay, I am only a messenger from thy Lord to announce to thee the gift of a holy son. So this verse talks about Mary, the mother of Isa. When the angel was sent to her by Allah to bring to her the news about the child, she would give birth to and that child was Isa, the holy one. It is not it wasn't that he'd never read these verses before because he used to read them quite a lot. 
But he had vowed to be reading the entire Quran every month and also to be reading the other books over and over again. So he started doing his research on the... Even before he started doing research on the 25th of December 2005, he, he wanted to connect the meanings that Isa is the Spirit of God. He wanted to look into that a bit deeper and that he was never defiled by Satan, that he is in heaven alive and he'll come back on earth from heaven. Him alone in the Quran, Surah... 349 he was given power to create as opposed to all other prophets sent by Allah yet the ability to create belongs to Allah alone and he also had the ability to know what people are doing or what food they're eating in their houses so when you read the entire Quran all its 30 sections and 114 chapters and 6236 verses You'll notice that the great, prominent and honoured prophets committed very many bad sins, which have been clearly recorded in the Quran. But as for Isa, he never committed any sin, great or small. And not only in the Quran, but the other important Islamic books also record the sins the other prophets did, but never Isa, the son of Mary. So more confirmations are found in the book, such as Swahil al Bukhari, Swahil Muslim, Abu Duda, Tiri Mahdi Tawabari, and others. And in these books, you will find numerous sins and faults. He says Muhammad himself attested in the Hadiths when he told his contemporaries that when the day of resurrection will come, Allah will gather the people in one vast field. They will be barefoot, naked. Then they will be made to stand in the gathering and the sun shall be moved close above their heads and they will undergo suffering by being scorched by the heat of the sun that has never been experienced since the creation of the world. People will run to Prophet Adam, begging him to plead with the Almighty God. But he too shall be mourning, saying that he also has sins he committed. So the story is quite long, but in summary, its message is this. Every prophet shall be crying, citing the sins he committed. But the story says that the prophet Jesus will not cry, nor say his sins because he committed none. So he, he analysed these words and the hatred that he used to have against Christians began to gradually melt away. He said it was like ice reduced to heat. Um, he still wasn't satisfied. So he did more research. So day after day, he was still performing his duties as an imam at the Shibail Mosque. And then now he decided to research on the Christian perspective of the death, resurrection and ascension of Prophet Isa. So he took the Quran, the Swahili translation, and opened the chapter Ali Imran, verse three, ver sorry, verse three, Surah three, verse 55. And this is what it says. It says, behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith to the day of resurrection. Then shall ye all return unto me and I will judge between you the matters wherein you dispute. So I'll just put it on the, uh, I'll just put it on the chat box here. And you can look it up yourself. And you can read it. You know, that's I'm just giving you the reference, basically. So you know what I'm actually talking about. So I'll just put that up on the screen now so you can actually see it. So that's the one I'm referencing now. It'll just come up now on the screen. There you go. That's, that's the surah. Okay. Okay. So... When he finished reading that verse, he noticed something in it from the way it was translated. Because he had looked for it as to be certain about the death of the prophet Isa. He analysed in depth the phrase, Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself. With a particular interest in the phrase, take thee. I took another kish wahilul, Halwili, 
translation known as Bawan, which was translated by Sheikh Ali Musin Al Bawani from Zanzibar. His translation for the phrase "take thee" was more accurate. To die. There he saw some truth in that. That to take thee and raise thee means for sure Isa died first, and then he ascended to heaven after the resurrection. Isa had to pass through death first. Again, he remembered the other verse, Surah 4157, that says that they said in both, we killed Christ, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him. So it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety, they killed him not. So after he read it, he said the verse had some important statements in it. They killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them, which in another translation says, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but the resemblance of Isa was put over another man, and they killed that man. So some questions were raised after he read this passage in the Quran, and this is one of the things that came to his mind and this is something that's come to my mind as well with regards to this how could Allah take another man and kill him on behalf of Isa would Allah be fair by doing that yet he himself he is a just God surah 4 verse 40 although we know Allah can do anything he pleases doing such unfair injustice to his people is not his pleasure at all those who differ, that is, who do not agree concerning the death of Isa or those in doubt, who are they? So since his research was based on the Quran and other Islamic books, he took the Arabic translation of Quran by Ibn Kathir and he opened Surah Ali Imran, which is Surah 355. And this is the verse that he, was, he spoke about earlier, I've mentioned. And his objective was to know who, who are different concerning the death of Jesus. And, and who were those in doubt? So we read in Arabic the phrase, those who differ therein are full of doubts. So let us now see this phrase. I will, phrase, sorry, I will take thee and raise thee to myself. And it was, it was interpreted by various Muslim scholars. So Mr. Qatar, Mr. Qatar, Qatar says, this is the beginning and the end. That means the Almighty God will raise Isa, then kill him after. This man, Qatada, among others, was a sheikh of Islam. In fact, among the earliest ones in Islam. Here, if you are not careful, you may fail to understand him and the others like him because you may interpret this section that after Isa had been taken to heaven, he came back to die later. But they say that he will die after being taken up. Okay. So the second interpretation is by Ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas is the brother to Muhammad and he interprets it this way. He says, I will take thee as I will slay thee or, or I will take thy life. So that means he, he, that Jesus died. The third is Wahab, who says the almighty God slew Jesus for a period of three hours in the early hours of the day. Then he raised him up to himself. The fourth interpretation is Sheikh Ibn Izihaka. He says the Christians think that Allah for sure killed Prophet Isa for a period of seven hours, then resurrected him. And the fifth interpretation is Sheikh Idris, who says Allah killed the Prophet Isa. Isa for a period of three days and then resurrected him and ascended him to heaven. So he studied these conflicting opinions and he said these were great men in Islam, but they do not have a consensus concerning the death of Jesus. And he asked this question, is it possible that it, it, it is us, the Muslims that differ and are in doubt and confused concerning the death of Jesus, not Christians? And he says, Hadith of Muhammad says, How shall it be with you when Isa, the son of Mary, shall descend? He will be your Iman, your leader, 
he will be a fair judge. And this hadith is found in the book called Abu Dada. Dada. Muhammad said that Prophet Isa is the one who will come to destroy that creature called the Dajjal, who will have wiped out people with famine, diseases and various other pestilences. And this story is obtained from the book Muslim, as quoted below. And this is what it says in, it says, Certainly the time of prayer shall come, and then Jesus, peace be upon him, son of Mary, would descend and would lead them in prayer. When the enemy of Allah, Dajjal, would see him, it would disappear. Just as the salt dissolves itself in water. And if he, Jesus, were not to confront them at all, even, even the, the, it would dissolve completely. But Allah would kill them by his hand, Jesus' his hand, and he would show them their blood on his lands, the lands of Jesus Christ. Sahih Muslim, book 041, number 6924, reported by Abu Huraira. And a similar quote from the book, Signs of Quimayama, by Muhammad Ali ibn Zubar Ali, is as follows. Dejal will lay claim to prophethood. He will lay claims to divinity. Finally, Isa will descend from the heavens and pursue him and eventually kill him at present day. So... So this 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 guy has, did his research, and when you read the Bible, when you read the 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 story of the crucifixion in the Bible, that's the true record of accounts what happened to Jesus. Okay, so I've got an article here called Christ's Crucifixion, and it's evidence for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it's by a guy called Silas. And he says here, Christ's crucifixion occurred about 2,000 years ago. This is documented by Roman, Jewish and Greek historians. However, the Quran denies the crucifixion occurred. The Quran goes against known recorded history. And this article will discuss Christ's historical crucifixion. So Christianity teaches that Jesus was crucified. All four Gospels record the crucifixion, resurrection and the ascension. But Muhammad and the Quran say Christ was not crucified. Muhammad appeared on the scene about 600 years after Jesus and Muhammad claimed to receive revelations from Allah given to him through Gabriel. And one of Muhammad's revelations was that Jesus was not crucified, which is in Surah 4157, which I've mentioned previously. So in other words, someone other than Jesus was crucified according to this verse. Because it says, they declared, we have put to death the Messiah Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but they had only his likeness. Okay. So the majority of Muslims believe this substitution theory. Yet the evidence from both the New Testament and other historical sources state that Christ was crucified. So the first evidence that I'm going to give is from the Bible. OK, so we're always going to firstly go to the scripture because that's my book. I'm a Christian. And then I'll get on to some other evidence with regards to it. OK. So Jesus predicted his own crucifixion and death. Jesus was not afraid to die. In fact, he predicted his own death and resurrection. Matthew 16, 21 says this. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. OK. Luke 18 verses 31 to 32. 
Jesus took the twelve aside and told them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. John 12, 30 to 32 says, and this is referring to the voice which came down from heaven. Um, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Matthew 26, 53, Jesus willingly went to the cross. And he says, do you not think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Matthew 26, 39 says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. John ten eighteen. Jesus says, no man takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. <coughs> Excuse me. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So the New Testament describes Jesus' crucifixion and his death. Um, Matthew 27, 32 to 50, I'm going to quote verse 55, says, When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And when Jesus had cried again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Luke 23, 26 to 46 says, this is verse 33. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him. Sorry. Along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus called out with a loud voice. This is verse 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. John 19, 17 to 30 says, this is verse 18. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Verse 30 says, when he had received the drink, Jesus says, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So we have biblical witnesses to Jesus' crucifixion and death. Matthew 27, 54 to 56 says, When the centurion, those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joses and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So, We've got these people who were there, okay, and Jesus' mother was there, and if Jesus had been substituted, if they'd been substituted, surely she would have known. She would have known. John nineteen twenty six says, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. Okay. So, Peter the Apostle, speaking to the crowd at the Jewish temple, this is Acts 2.23, and he says this, This man referring to Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. 
and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Paul speaks in Acts 13, 29. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. The tree is referring to the cross. So I'm going to give you some historical references as evidence as well. And this is evidence from Jewish sources. This is the Talmud. This is hostile source and it's Talmud Sanhedrin 43a and it says this on the eve of the Passover Yeshua which is Jesus was hanged or crucified since nothing was brought forward in his favor he was hanged on the eve of the Passover that's in line with what the Bible teaches because it says Christ is our Passover lamb so he was crucified on the eve of Passover. So we have the Amo Ulla. Ulla was a disciple of Yushma and lived in Palestine at the end of the third century. And this is what he says. And do you suppose that for Yeshua of Nazareth, Jesus, there was any right of appeal? He was a beguiler. And the merciful one have said, thou shalt not spare, neither thou shalt conceal him. It is otherwise with Yeshua, for he was near to the civil authority. So one thing to take on board here is that the writers of the Talmud took their job seriously. These men were Jews who did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They were not Christians, but they documented Christ's crucifixion. OK. So these didn't even. They didn't believe in Jesus as a Messiah. And these are hostile but they still recorded him as being crucified. Okay. Cornelius Tacitus in his annals says this, Christus, Christus was executed at the hands of the procurator, the procurator Pontius Pilate. And that's what the Bible says Pontius Pilate was a procurator. Okay. Lucian Samosata says this, Christ was the man who was crucified in Palestine. Note here, these men are professional historians. They researched their work before publishing it. They also documented Christ's crucifixion. So therefore, three types of witness, all of whom are from the first or early second century, have been presented. Okay. So... So we've got some other historical references as evidence as well. Let's just have a look. Yeah, this is, just give me one second. It's, okay. Yeah. Okay, it says here, so this is a part test for determining the credibility of the witnesses and it's based on David Hume's criteria. So number one, do the witnesses contradict each other? Are there a sufficient number of witnesses? Were the witnesses truthful? Were they non prejudicial Were they without prejudice? prejudice? So the part one says the answer to this question is the witnesses do not contradict each other. The Christian, Roman and Jewish witnesses all agree that Jesus was crucified. There is indeed a sufficient number of witnesses, several witnesses from Christian sources and two witnesses from Roman and Jewish sources have been presented. There are actually more witnesses that could be mentioned, but this is enough. Part three, the witnesses are truthful. There is no documented evidence contradicting what the witnesses presented. All of the early sources that mention Jesus' death all state that he was crucified. So a case could be made for the Christian sources being prejudiced. However, they were Christians because they witnessed Christ's death and Christ's resurrection. The Jewish and Roman witnesses were clearly not prejudiced at all. So the conclusion is this, Jesus Christ was crucified. All of the known evidence supports and corroborates the crucifixion. There is no legitimate reason doubting Christ's crucifixion. 
So it's uh, Muhammad and the Quran are flawed. Muhammad made an error when he said that Christ was not crucified. Muhammad was not a truth prophet. The Quran's not the word of God. Okay. So what you need to do, you have to come to the truth for this book. And Jesus says, you'll know the truth and it'll set you free. Okay. I urge you to come to Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the life, the true Messiah, the one that sent to redeem all mankind from the curse of sin, to bring us back in a right relationship with the Father, to redeem us and to free us from the prison of sin. The cross, my friend, is what Christ died on. Jesus loves you and he loves you so much that he was willing to die on a cruel cross so that you could have forgiveness, so that you could spend eternity in heaven. Because for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, I heard Hamza speak on his stream and he said Christianity answers a question. It deals with a problem that doesn't exist. Words to that effect. Okay. And I think he was referring to the problem of sin. Hamza seems to think that in order to get your sins forgiven, all you have to do is say, I'm sorry, God. That's the end of the story. But what you've got to take into consideration is this. The Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. We are eternal beings. And God had to make an eternal sacrifice once and for all to redeem all of mankind. And that eternal sacrifice was made at the cross where Jesus shed his precious blood. He shed his blood and that blood is an atonement for your sin eternally. It's, it's called the new and everlasting covenant. That means it's forever. Okay. Because we're eternal beings, we need to be redeemed forever, eternally. Because the Bible says that when we die, it's appointed for men to die once and then the judgment. Okay? So you either go to heaven or you go to hell. That They're the two places that are on option. Okay? And Jesus came from heaven. He appeared as a man to be our saviour. You see, the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Now, yeah, yeah, you can say to God, yeah, I'm sorry, forgive me. But you you think about this, right, Hamza, and I'm, I'm addressing you specifically because this is an important point. You see, God is a judge, OK, and he's a just judge. So and he has a law. And every person in this world has broken God's law, broken his Ten Commandments. OK, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. OK, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So if you broke the law in this country, England, and you went to court and you said to the judge, judge, I'm guilty. I'm sorry for breaking the law. Please, you know, forgive me. The judge will just say, you know what? I appreciate that you're sorry, but because I'm a just judge, I have to judge you according to the law. And more than likely, depending on the crime, you'll be set, sent to prison. And it's the same with God. If you sinned in this life and you reject his eternal atonement, which is Jesus Christ, then he has to judge you by the law because the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. The law is the knowledge of sin. OK, we can't keep the law. The intention of God's law was to show us what God likes, what he doesn't like. And it's to show his holiness and to show that we are sinners before him. That was the intention of the law, you see. So. Just being sorry will not wash away your sin. God made a sacrifice for sin, and that was Jesus Christ. 
And that was an eternal sacrifice. And it says those who put their trust in Jesus Christ, as their personal Lord and Saviour, shall have everlasting life. But you have to repent. You have to turn away from your sin and accept that you could never, ever do enough good works and you, and you can repent till you're blue in the face. But repentance does not get a person into heaven. Only Jesus does. Because Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Not through repentance. Not for saying, oh, I'm sorry. Repentance is key. It's good to repent. But repent and turn to Jesus Christ and trust in him as your personal Lord and Saviour. He shed his precious blood on that cross. He suffered an agonising death so that you wouldn't go to hell, so that you could have heaven and not experience the horrors of hell. Because God hates sin. God is holy. He hates sin. Yeah? So he had to deal with sin, and he dealt with it in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. He became our substitute on that cross. He died for every sin that you've ever done. If you reject this, then you will have to pay your own sin. And the wages of sin is death. The debt of sin is too high. Repentance, good works will not pay that debt. Only the precious blood of Jesus. So Christianity does deal with the problem of sin. And it deals with it eternally in Jesus Christ. Now, in the Quran, there's no assurance of salvation. Muhammad even said, I do not know what will become of me. I am but just a warner. Now, if Islam is the perfect religion, where is your assurance of salvation? Because I've spoke to many Muslims and I said, if I become a Muslim, right, if I leave my Christian faith, Will I go to heaven? And he says, God willing. I don't know. So the point is, there's no, there's no assurance of salvation. But in Christianity, there is eternal life. There's hope. We have hope. So I'm just going to read a bit of Romans, because Romans just nails this point quite well. I would ask you to read Romans carefully and prayerfully and the holy spirit will speak to you because it i would hate for anyone to have to go to hell when they have a chance to go to heaven and jesus wants to save you he doesn't want to see anyone perish you know he loves every person he loves muslims he loves atheists but you've got to seek the lord with all your heart and come to him in faith. So just go to the book of Romans. Romans is one of the most meatiest, powerfulest books of the New Testament. It's an amazing book. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I've read it many times and it just speaks to me in so many ways. Amazing book. So it says here, this is Romans 5. Verse 12 onwards, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, it's talking about Adam, and death through sin, and thus, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. But sin was not imputed when there is no law, for until the law, sin was in the world. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So Jesus is known as the second Adam. But the free gift is not like the offence. For if by the one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offences resulted in 
justification. For if by one man's offence death reign through the one, how much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, we're sinners. You see, when Adam, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden with Eve and they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that one sin, that one offence resulted in them being banished from the presence of God. They were banished from the Garden of Eden. OK. And there was a flaming sword, it says in Genesis. And it was guarding the way to the tree of life. So we couldn't go back that way. You couldn't go back in there. You'd been banished from the garden. God cursed the ground. Sin had entered God's perfect creation. And Adam had given over God's creation. Adam had given, had given everything that God had given to the devil. He gave it to the devil because the devil deceived him. Satan was on the earth. He'd been thrown out of heaven to the earth and he deceived Adam and Eve. You see, God gives us choice. Adam and Eve had a choice. If they had listened to God, we, we wouldn't have this problem in the world today, which is sin. Because sin isn't just disobeying God. It goes much deeper than that. It corrupts the whole human soul, spirit, everything. We are in rebellion against God because of what Adam did. That nature of sin is imputed to the whole human race. Adam was the head of the human race. He was given dominion over the works of God's hands, the creation of God. And through that one sin, he handed that all over to Satan. So now Satan's on the earth and sin is in every person so the fruits of sin this is the fruits of the flesh this is sin jesus said there's murder in our hearts there's adultery in our hearts covetousness we lie we cheat we steal this is this is what sin does it corrupts us completely before sin came into the world there was none of this we didn't have any of this problem problem it, it was heaven but now sin is in the world and it is a problem it is uh, but the christian god deals with it but allah doesn't deal with sin unfortunately so what i would say come to jesus christ come to the cross ask him say lord reveal yourself show me who you are if you're true reveal yourself and he'll do it he shall reveal himself because the Holy Spirit will reveal Christ. It will reveal the truth. So, read this book carefully. Give your life to Jesus, because he's the only way of salvation. He loves you, and he wants a relation with you. Thank you for listening. God bless.